Hi, Makers audience. I'm Soledad O'Brien, and it is my pleasure to interview the hilarious comedian Jenny Yang. Nice to see you, Jenny. How are you? I'm so good. Good to see you. I like that we're pink today. I know. And solidarity with the makers, I guess. Uh, listen, I, I have so much to talk to you about. And I and some of it's fun and some of it's stressful because it has been a crazy time. It's been a crazy time. Before we get to the stressful stuff, I want to start with comedy. How did you become a comedian? Because you, you started off as a labor organizer and it doesn't seem like that would lead to comedy at all, ever. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like our maker's audience understands what it means to have many chapters in their lives, right? And I think for me, I've always been a performer. I'm an immigrant, so I've had to perform on the stage of learning English. And then, and then, you know, I like got really into trying to save the world as one does. But, you know, to me, I realized, okay, I can try to save the world, but do I have to do it by being super stressed out in an environment that might not you know, uh, support my creativity. So I decided to become a comedian. Honestly, I was burnt out. I was going to sock my coworkers if I didn't do something creative. So rather than be charged with assault and battery, I think it's best if uh, I try improv and stand-up comedy. That's what happened. Let's listen. Definitely We're honest better. here. Yes. Honesty is everything. <laughs> definitely better. So if you're doing stand-up and you're doing improv, and then of course COVID-19 comes about, what were your first thoughts about sort of everything live with an audience, which I would think is essential to a comedian. Suddenly it's like, no more. Yeah. I mean, stand-up comedy is defined by standing up in front of people, you know, and it just kind of took, it took the wind out of everyone's sails. I think, you know, I was sad about the world. I was sad about everyone being sick, but also, you know, we had as comedians, we had our hopes and dreams of, you know, what we wanted to do for 2020. And there we were in our home with no audience and maybe a TikTok dance that we could do. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. that's what we were left with, which listen, I'm not, I'm not saying don't do TikTok dances. I did it at the beginning of the pandemic, but it was it was a lot of like, what do we do now? How do we maintain this craft that really requires daily practice? And so um, that's when I started an online stand-up comedy show inside a video game called Comedy Crossing. That's that's how I adapted. So you, I did an online. You started a comedy club inside Animal Crossing. So for people who are not knowledgeable about Animal Crossing. Explain exactly what you did and how you did it. And then talk to me about how it's gone because it's it's been a huge hit. Yeah. I mean, I think no one wants to not be around real people, but, you know, in, in light of what was happening in the world, it felt very empowering to at least be with other people on a Zoom meeting, like the, the gentlest, funnest free Zoom meeting where you get to see your favorite stand-up comedians perform in a little picture window in the corner while the share screen is of my Animal Crossing video game of cute little Japanese animals and people. Like what, like how do you not, this is how we survive. Honestly, it was my way of surviving. So I didn't, you know, just cry myself to sleep every night because the world was so oppressive. And so it, it just, it made me feel better. It brought people together. And it was also around the time that George Floyd Jr. was murdered. And I felt like it was something I could do by doing the show and then getting donations to support Black Lives Matter related causes. And so I think all around it felt empowering despite the circumstances. And it was just a matter of figuring out the technology. And and uh, these days I feel like, you know, makers folks know, like, there is no limit because of technology now. We have access to everything. So, yeah, it was it was really been, a life saver, honestly. Yeah, we've been forced to innovate, which has been, I think, a good thing, actually, that's come out of a lot of really kind of challenging things over the past year. Why did you pick Black Lives Matter? And, and how much money have you been able to raise? Uh, we've raised about $40,000 since June of 2020 with some breaks. Yeah. And, and it's just because of our generous audience and just people who managed to find us. Um, I mean, I, I chose Black Lives Matter because I feel like it. we are in a historical moment and it is a matter of participating or not. You know, I think what's happening now is very important. And to me, you know, my liberation as an Asian American woman is connected to that of uh, Black Americans 
things. And so to, it, it was a no brainer to say, you know, let me just do my part uh, to support what needed to be done. Do you think that people are beginning to understand this idea that we're sort of all in the same boat together and that fixing these problems for one community. It's been interesting to me to watch the solidarity, I think, between African-Americans as we've seen more violence against Asian-Americans and Asian people generally. There was a horrible story uh, just the other day, a man and his baby. I mean, just, uh, and and there'll be another mm-hmm. one tomorrow because it's it's been absolutely awful. And and I guess the one thing that's been encouraging is to see people in all kinds of communities step forward and say, this is not OK. Often, as you know, what happens is each community kind of has to tackle it by um, by their them, themselves. Do you are you surprised by that? Number one. And what do you think we have to keep doing to make sure that each community sees itself in another community's struggles? Yeah, I'm not surprised at all at, at what's been happening. You know, I feel like the violence has always been there. The solidarity between groups has always been there. It's just a matter of having this beautiful technology we have in our hands called our cell phones that has allowed us, right, to document everyday instances as well as amplify them. And so I think to me, you know, Asian Americans have a long history of solidarity work with others and black folks and vice versa and other groups. I think it's uh, it's a, a very special moment now, though, that we all are now kind of forming this collective consciousness that, oh, yeah, like this is all happening. It's all happening to each other in our own special way, but it's all connected. And and so I think I feel hopeful that because of it, the Internet, social media and our ability to share notes, so to speak, that we can continue to uh, weave our stories together rather than keep stay siloed in a way that maybe we thought we used to be. And um, that that's what gives me hope. I think uh, if, if, if I didn't have that hope, then then I would just, I would just continue eating my ice cream and drinking my cocktails only. I mean, I'm still going to continue doing that, silly dog. But, but with hope. Not only that. Yeah. Do you think, I mean, it was interesting to me when George Floyd was killed, the number of people who I think it opened their eyes. And I feel like I've been doing documentaries on this for a long time. So number one, they hadn't been watching my documentaries, but number two, like, this is his his killing was not the first, not the 10th, not the 50th. And yet for them, it was kind of the first most shocking, most eye opening. And I think same with violence in the Asian American community. You know, people are stunned and you want to say, yeah, well, it's it's been there before. Do you see society changing as everyone's eyes are are open to this? Yeah, I feel like because of social media, we have created a movement of voices that traditionally have been kept out by the gatekeepers, right, who are finally saying this matters and you need to do something and say something about it. And I feel like that collective pressure and I'm very proud to be a part of that social media movement, you know, uh, of the last 10 years, um, you know, amplifying diverse voices, you know, having folks be called to the to the mat in case they do something that's a little off color, so to speak, you know? And so I believe that that movement for uh, a greater awareness, uh, for more pressure to say or do something about injustices is only going to benefit everyone and especially benefit those who are, are the most vulnerable and, and, and usually mal- marginalized. And so um, I I hope that, you know, it's, it's hard, right? Like being held accountable for something you did wrong, whether you personally did it or historical institutional racism or other isms did it, doesn't feel good, right? Someone being like, Solida, I'm sorry, you did something wrong and you need to atone for that. That doesn't feel good. But I hope that through art, through joy, through conversation, um, through, you know, mutual support, we can say, it's okay. We're all in this together. Um, it's going to suck. Sometimes I'm going to mess up. You're going to mess up, but we are trying to move toward this beautiful vision of, of, of justice together. Right. And so I, I, that's why I think it's so important to have media folks, uh, like you artists, other people who have a platform to be able to say, it's okay to speak up. It's okay to be held accountable. And so it's okay to atone and make up for what we've done wrong. And so that's, that's my hope and vision moving forward for all of this mess. (laughs) There's a narrative that would say, well, that's cancel culture. 
Uh, I, I would call it being held accountable. <laughs> I, I mean, truly, right? Like, and and you hear people talking about the cancel culture while they're doing interviews <laughs> on many networks, <laughs> talking about how they've been canceled live on TV, um, which is surprising. But uh, but but truly, like, there's a sense like that's cancel culture versus a sense of wow, I really regret what I did. I'm sorry. I I, I screwed that up. And I and how do I fix it? And maybe I don't shouldn't get the promotion. Shouldn't get the massive you know, uh, next big thing, next big job, next, you know, book on a big platform. Is, do you think, Kat, is it a thing, this cancel culture idea, or is it just being held accountable? I mean, I feel like you said it yourself, cancel culture is being thrown around like a pejorative or a dirty word by the very people who say they're being canceled while they're still speaking on a, you know, platform that reaches millions. And so to me, you know, being truly canceled means that you can't make a living at all. Now, does it mean you're going to make a living from the thing that you were canceled from, so to speak? Maybe not. But I believe most of the people who are be, have who have been held accountable, and I'm including all the folks who were uh, spoken about during the Me Too kind of uprising, right, in recent years, that they're going to be just fine. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, they're going to be just fine. Maybe they don't have the big show that they originally had, right? But I think cancel culture is not necessarily a real thing. I think a, a, a cultural shift, I feel like an advancement of the culture toward more justice, toward saying maybe what we used to do is not okay anymore. I think that's just growth. That's growth. Natasha Rothwell's Give growth. That's what we. That's what we're talking about. Shout out to is Insecure fan. Is it hard to find things that are funny in an environment where we've got a pandemic? You've got you know active violence. I mean, there's a lot of bad things happening in the world. And you're a comedian. Do you feel some days like, oh my gosh, there's nothing fun about you know what I have to say to an audience? No. Oh my goodness. When things are the harshest and the saddest, that's when you need humor the most, right? I mean, I feel like, you know, comedy is born out of so much of a legacy of, of, of marginalized groups in America from Jewish folks to black folks. And, and I feel like we're living as a comedian, we, we stand on the shoulders of those giants who, who took their pain, you know, and, and the pain of the time and turned it into something beautiful and something that could could give us life. And so I, you know, I, I completely object to the idea that we can't find humor in the toughest of places, um, because that's just a matter of human survival. Have you learned anything about yourself in the pandemic? Is there something where you're like, wow, going through this for a year now, several months, I figured out that I can do, or I am what? Um, I think during this pandemic, I have realized that I already had the survival skills and the resilience within me um, to be able to make it through this unprecedented time. And I think a lot of my friends who are immigrants, who might have come from more working class backgrounds, honestly, um, who are people of color, who are differently abled, um, have sort of mentioned through our casual conversations that as hard as everything has been, as many losses as people have suffered, for those of us who have been fortunate enough to survive, um, a lot of that survival comes from, frankly, being comfortable with not having much or having had experienced hardship. You know, I mean, people people are complaining about needing to stay home, not being able to go out and dine out or do things. Well, you know, when you grow up with not a lot of extra spending money, you just kind of figure that out, <laughs> you know? Um, and so uh, having limited mobility, all of it. And, and, and so I think that's one of the things that I um, feel very fortunate and blessed to have had that kind of resilience generationally through my life, you know, uh, taught to me um, and, and, and within my experience so that we can at least, you know, survive and have our souls be intact. Sometimes a struggle and growing up in a struggle can be an advantage in some way in the big picture of life. Jenny Yang, what a great opportunity to chat with you. Thank you so much. Really, always a pleasure. You're so much fun and you're so funny. And I, I always love talking to you. Always. You're the best. <laughs>